good evening. A pleasure to have all of you here with us tonight. Um, I have the honor of introducing Marta Daniels. She is a writer and public historian, and for 35 years of her professional career, she's been devoted to expanding and improving civic engagement, education, and public policy issues on peace and justice. For 10 years, she was the director of the Options Scholars Program at Watson Institute for the International and Public Affairs at Boston University. Brown. 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 Boston, sorry. Brown University. <laughs> uh, while there, she was also the co-director for the Brown National Public Policy Discussion Program for public libraries across 36 states funded by the National Endowment for the Humanities. For 13 years prior to this experience, she was also the director of the Connecticut American Friends Service Committee and a co-director for the Nuclear Weapons Freeze Campaign. Marta also served as a consultant for the United States Institute of Peace, the MacArthur Foundation, the Connecticut Humanities Council, and the Connecticut Fund for the Environment. She is the author of three books, and her professional papers are archived in the Dodd Research Center at UConn, in the Manuscripts and Archives Library at Yale University, as well as Swarthmore College Peace Collection. Marta was our lead author on the Freedom Trail application that was submitted by this land trust, which required research to compile the relevant materials regarding Judge Motley, her achievements, and her life here in Chester. Marta's application for us informed, was informed, she was informed by her own experience as a veteran and veteran in the civil rights movement, an organizer of the 1968 Poor People's Campaign in Washington, D.C., and a participant in desegregation marches and voter registrations across the South. The Land Trust appreciates all the time and work that she has given to this successful effort for us, and she is the most informed, knowledgeable person in this room to give us an educational overview of, uh, Martha's, of uh, Judge Motley's life and her accomplishments, and we want to be able to first show you the achievement. I mean, this is the application. It took about three months to put this thing together in terms of the background and the research that was done, so we appreciate that. I also want to say a thank you to the Historical Society because they gave us so much of the materials that we used in terms of the archives and the research done, and many of these pictures came from the Motley family, and a lot of work was done to compile all of this background information, so it really has been a labor of love. And also, Marta, uh, take home tonight this lovely plant that we want to express to you our appreciation. Uh, may roses grow in your yard. And they're so, making roses, right? Ah, yes, they are. Good for you. Okay. So with that, please, Marta. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yes. All right. Good. Um, first of all, I really appreciate the opportunity. I never get tired of talking about Constance Baker Motley. She has been a hero or a shiro to me for many, many years. Um, actually, not many years because I didn't know, and I was here 15 years concomitant with her, living in Chester, and I only knew her as a federal judge. And um, I was just appalled when I happened to turn on CPTV, and there was this fabulous public television video about her life that described a whole additional person that I didn't even know had existed on Cedar Lake Road. And so that just intrigued me, and I decided I would find out more about her, and I've made it the past five years working on that, that uh, research. And before I go any further, I just want to ask how many people knew Judge Motley here, or just knew, you know, was a passing acquaintance, knew of her on, in the neighborhood? You did, okay, right. Well, then I can't tell too many lies, so you all know her <laughs> somehow. Um, but I assure you, and I'll bet you you'll back me up, that you just knew her as the judge, most of you, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's really very seldom that we get to experience and live close 
to a person who has, such ha has had so much impact on American history. And that history was recognized by the Connecticut Freedom Trail this November with that application. And they recognize um, African Americans who live in Connecticut who have done substantial work to improve um, civil rights and human rights for African Americans. So it was a great honor to have both the preserve and the house placed on the Freedom Trail. And I, we're so glad that Courtney and Dennis and Donna have come tonight to join us because they should be honored too. They get a plaque and we get a plaque and it's really important that this has happened. I also want to acknowledge and, and introduce you to Dr. Carl Stofko, who is from East Haddam and he is the municipal historian for East Haddam, but he's also a caregiver for the other nearby Connecticut Freedom Trail site, the Venture Smith site, in the cemetery of the First Church of Christ. And he is the official representative of the Freedom Trail, the Connecticut Freedom Trail, here tonight. So we're really pleased, and I'm sure he will report back that we had a great turnout and people were interested to know about this great lady. Um, so, just to, to get us started, um, it was, I think it was Emerson who said that there is no history, there's only biography. That it's human beings who make and change our world by what they do in their lifetime. And Judge Motley was such a person and probably will never get any closer to anyone than a person like Motley who lived among us for 40 years between 1965 and 2005 when she died. And so when I think of her, I think of Emerson's quote about history, not history, but biography. And you're going to see that tonight. It's appropriate that we celebrate this woman in February, which is Black History Month, but it's also our American history. And that's what I want you to, you know, to take away tonight. It's not just a black person, but it is all of us. So I'm going to start this slideshow, and I want to warn you that we're going to go fast and slow, because pictures are worth a thousand words, and you don't have to read everything in small text at the bottom. Just pay attention to the headlines. And we, we're going to show you the four stages of her life, and then her life in Chester and her achievements and awards, which you've been able to see on some of these, these posters. Um, I am only going to spend a little bit of time on everything except for her civil rights work, because it is for that work that she got this placement on the heritage, as a heritage site on the Connecticut Freedom Trail. She was a great judge, and she did push out the circle of freedom an opportunity for women, for human rights, and for civil rights when she was a federal judge. But her real work and the courage of her life happened in the years between 19, really 1946 when she became a lawyer, and 1964 when she came home from the South and became, did something else with her life. So that's what I'm going to concentrate on, and it comes pretty early in the show. And uh, I'll tell you, you don't have to try to read everything, but I'll tell you what's important about the images that you're seeing. So, she was born in 1921, and she said something which we think is impossible now it is not impossible in another decade. How true that was. This is her home, her childhood home in New Haven. It too is on the Connecticut Freedom Trail and has been there since the 90s. Just has a plaque, it's privately owned. No public access, but it's there. She was ni the ninth of 12 children who were born to a West Indies immigrant couple by the name of Willoughby and Rachel Baker. And they um, were very hardworking people who managed to give a good life to their children, but they were not uh, rich by any means. He was a chef at Yale, and her mother was a seamstress. And they didn't believe that girls should have a professional career. This is the Troop Middle School where she was a, let me see if I can find it. She was a student. This is her seventh grade picture. It's where she saw the picture of the painting 
of the Amistad by the WPA, the uh, Works Project Administration, when she was a student in 1934. She said, when I was 15, I decided I wanted to be uh, a lawyer, and no one thought this was a very good idea. And so I, th I found that very humorous, because she turned out to be such a great lawyer. And she also thought she, she should follow in the steps of Lincoln. This is Clarence Blakely, who made tonight's meeting possible because he was the one who funded Constance Motley in her quest for education and for her goal of helping people. Um, the Blakesley Engineering Company, they built the infrastructure in New Haven and the aqueduct from Albany to New York. They were wealthy and Mr. Blakesley really tried to support children of low-income families to go to college. And he built the Dixwell Community Center, which I'm sure mo many of you know, and he couldn't understand why the children didn't come and use it. And so he ran a contest, and she answered the call, and she gave this marvelous speech about how, you know, they have no say in what happens at the community center, so that's, you know, a lot of why kids don't participate. And he said, are you going to school? She was already 18, just out of high school, could not afford to go to school, and he said, come and see me. She did, they talked, he asked her, if she knew what she wanted to be, and she said yes. And he said, what's that? And she said, well, I want to be a lawyer. He said, well, I would like to help you get through undergraduate school as well as um, law school. And you can go anywhere you want. I will pay for it. She was thrilled, and she never forgot Clarence Blakesley. And we shouldn't forget him either, because he had a lot to do with something in our town of Chester. And we'll get to that near the end of the show. So she graduated from NYU in 1943 with honors degree in economics, and she graduated from Columbia University Law School in 1946. Beautiful photograph. She married uh, Joel Motley in uh, 1946 as well in New Haven. And um, I want to back up here. This is the first view we're going to get of um, Mr. Motley. And I'm going to I can never find this clicker. There it is. Um, he was probably one of the most important people in the work of Constance Baker Motley because he was a progressive husband. He understood her work, and he decided from early on that he was going to support her in any way that she needed to be supported. And of course, you know, they, they had a family. We're actually living at the, at the YMCA now. That's where she met them. But this particular quote is really important for our town as well. It broadened her horizons, and she built a family with Joel Sr., with Joel Jr., um, who the senior had to take care of all the years that she was in the South working. So her first career was with the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. Um, she said that she, she rejected the notion that my race or sex would bar my success in life. And she actually achieved that. It did not hold her back. This was attorney Thurgood Marshall, who was the lead chief counsel of the Legal Defense Fund. It was actually called the Legal Defense and Education Fund, the Inc. Fund, but they just said LDF. And it's still around today, very active. But he recognized that she was a really, really valuable uh, intellect and a great lawyer, and he hired her as the first female LDF lawyer uh, for the organization. This was their team in, in 1946 when she joined, very small. But they were determined they were going to take on segregation. And so they, they decided to build a case for Brown for the Brown versus Board of Education Supreme Court decision in 1954. And Motley was a, was, wrote the very first brief in that case, um, which um, is in the next slide here. Sweat V. Painter uh, admitting a University of Texas School of Law student. And she helped then make it a reality from 1954 to 1964, 10 years. The reason they chose public schools, 
uh, was because they were the easiest to show inequality. And if you see <laughs> the public school in Washington, D.C., you see the outlining, Hall uh, um, what is the, the county, Halifax County in Virginia, not far from there. Um, and so they decided to do it with public schools. They could have done it in other ways, but they chose public schools because it was easy to show. Now, one of the things that I understood late to my research in Constance Baker Motley was that the Brown versus Board of Education decision was the culmination of almost 70 years of history. And you cannot understand Brown unless you understand what preceded it. So I'm going to just really go quickly through the history leading up to Brown. And it's important because when I think about her work and others, we usually think of cases that are being changed, laws that are being changed, sit-ins that change history. But really what the people were doing in the civil rights movement in the South in the 50s and 60s was getting rid of the physical terror of being black in the South. And that was a tremendous challenge because it was dangerous to oppose this. And I just want to show you, just really quickly, the Equality Amendments occurred right after the Civil War, which gave African Americans full citizenship. The 13th Amendment got rid of slavery. The 14th Amendment was due process, equal access, full citizenship, overturned the Dred Scott decision of 1857 that said black people could not be citizens of this country. Tremendous. Uh, amendments to the Constitution. And the 15th Amendment gave people the right to vote, African Americans, the full right to vote. It led to this reconstruction period where African Americans flourished. They built whole communities of uh, inclusivity and um, entrepreneurship. They were active in business associations. They elected 1,500 people to political office between 1865 and 1877. 1,500 people were elected because of the vote that they had. But all of this was enforced by federal troops being in the South to enforce the amendments that were given to the Constitution. In the Compromise of 1877, all of this be was the beginning of disappearance for this kind of freedom and citizenship. The compromise was the result of the election of 1876 in which Rutherford B. Hayes and Samuel Tilden were in a draw as to who won the election, the Republican or the Democrat, and it was locked up in the Electoral College. They couldn't settle it. There was a disputed election in Florida, Georgia, and North Car South Carolina. So the compromise was that the Republican could continue to still be president, Rutherford B. Hayes. But all federal troops had to be removed from the South, which they, they called the return of home rule. They could go back to the way they were. That was the compromise. And it was also the beginning of the end of Reconstruction in the South. This led directly to Plessy v. Ferguson in 1896, which is really important because Brown overturned Plessy v. Ferguson. And that was a SCOTUS decision that legalized segregation. And it was a direct antecedent to Brown. And it was over a dispute about whether black people could sit in the same railroad car as white people. And the answer was no, separate but equal. And so all of this was halted by this uh, compromise. And it triggered a license to abuse former slaves. And it reversed many of the gains that were made. Um, Plessy v. Ferguson was separate but equal. It legalized segregation. That's what it did. But it also resulted in 70 years of the most amazing history in our country. And we lose sight of this, which we shouldn't because of what's happening today. It increased Jim Crow laws and repression and loss of all civil rights for blacks. It increased the Ku Klux Klan activity, Birth of a Nation, the film that showed black people only wanted to go after white women, and it 
enraged the white community and increased the Ku Klux Klan membership. It accelerated mass lynchings, burnings, beatings, and physical terror, and it began the great migration of six million blacks out of the South to northern states. So the Jim Crow laws, these were segregation laws that just kept black and white separate, which is what the white community in the South wanted. I've given some examples of uh, some Jim Crow laws. You probably are aware of them. And I do apologize if some of you really know this history well, but I confess I'm one of the people that did not really understand this history as I should have understood it. It resulted in the reemergence and increase of the Ku Klux Klan. This is some, they were public, they were social. It was a great club and people wanted to be in it. And they were massive in numbers. And it resulted in extrajudicial lynchings. I think this is one of the most important slides in the show because there were 4,400 nationwide lynchings between 1877 and 1950, but 11 of them were, were uh, 3,837 were in only 11 states. And those states are listed here, Mississippi being the greatest by the number of lynchings that occurred. And these are the states where Brown v. Board of Education was fought out. Imagine the physical terror that people felt. And what did it result in? Well, we also know what, what these <laughs> lynchings look like. Women, including men, there were burnings of, of black people. They just burned them at the stake, literally. And in the lower left-hand corner, you'll see a sign that says, um, uh, I, uh, there was another lynching yesterday or today. And that is the flag that hung out of the New York City Legal Defense Fund throughout the 30s and the 40s and probably the 50s. I just, I, I just find this uh, very sad. It resulted finally in the great migration of African Americans to the North between 1900 and 1950. Six million of them fled and it was the lynchings and the racial violence of Jim Crow laws that kept people separated that led to the migration and what they called the Black Holocaust. We got Aretha Franklin and we got Motown and we got the Chicago Blues, but we got them at a terrible price. And that price was the physical um, abuse and repression of African Americans. So that is the background that led up to Brown versus Board of Education, to, do, to reverse the Plessy v. Ferguson Supreme Court decision of 1896. And I'm gonna go through many of these slides quickly. I think images speak louder than words, but I just want you to have a sense of what this looked like. This was hard because you had to find young people who were willing to serve as student guinea pigs to be integrated into these white supremacy schools. They didn't want people of color in their schools. So that was, a, that. it took months, sometimes years, to find the students and then to petition for entry and all kinds of frivolous uh, challenges were made. Thurgood Marshall chose Constance Baker Motley to go to the South to be the Southern face in the courtroom and he did it knowing, and I'm gonna go over her, her, the reasons he did it, but the problem was that the Supreme Court didn't specify when desegregation should happen in these colleges, public you know, educational institutions. So they had to fight the tools that the white supremacists used, which were delay, obstruct, and intimidate. Motley's role in Brown was really significant, probably greater than anybody else's as far as her physical presence in the South and in the importance of the court cases that she won. She was the chief strategist uh, for Brown. She was the face in the Southern courtroom and the primary litigant. She was the lead counsel in over 200 cases across 11 Southern states at all court levels and assisted in hundreds of others. And she argued 10 cases before the US Supreme Court, the first African American woman to do so. So the question becomes, why was Motley chosen? 
what was, what was it about her? Well, first I'm going to go back. She was brilliant. She had a good mind. She had presence. She was able to think on her feet. By the way, she was the first African-American woman ever to argue in a southern courtroom in 1949 in Jackson, Mississippi, over a, a, a pay equity salary lawsuit uh, of an African-American teacher, and she won. Nobody had ever gone into a southern courtroom uh, as a female, and certainly not a black woman. She was confident. She had a self-confidence because she knew her facts. She was a hard worker. She studied everything. And she was the kind of person who didn't get flustered. But mostly, she was sent because she was a woman. How many people have seen the movie The Help? Okay. All the white children had black women caregivers. They were the least threatening kinds of people that you could put in front of a white male courtroom. And so they sent Motley, and she fulfilled this role with dignity and with great success. And I think it's really interesting. Uh, she spent more time in the South, and she commuted from New York City, where they had their home, down to all the 11 southern states to do her work. These are the major cases that she won. There were about 10 or 15. I just list a few. We don't have to read them. But they were in every one of the major southern states that uh, have, were, were significant for their lynchings and their violence against people. I'm going to look, uh, and I also want to say that not only did she do those cases, but she also was instrumental in the Montgomery bus boycott, the lunch counter sit-ins, the Freedom Riders, the Albany, Georgia movement, and the Birmingham, Alabama desegregation campaign. She helped King with his successful march. She used the Civil Rights Act to, uh, I'm going to get to that too in the slideshow, but to undo the, the convictions of the lunch counter sit-ins. And she was a voting rights activist. She felt really strongly about the importance of being able to vote. So the fight begins. As I said, they had to find the right students. They had to find people who were willing to hang in there and struggle with this. And we're going to look at just three or four cases that, through pictures, will help you understand what was really happening in the South. The Little Rock Nine, I think most people know about the Little Rock Nine. It was a high school, in, in uh, Central High School. The first day that the admission of the black students was agreed to by the school, there was mass white protest. Look at that big school. Look at all those people. The young black people tried to go in, but they were threatened. And you can see from these pictures what an angry white mob looks like. Armed troops turned the students back, meaning the National Guard of the state, turned the students back. And Motley appealed to Eisenhower to send federal troops to protect the students. Notice this case doesn't start until 1957. Several other cases, the first Alabama, University of Alabama case, failed because Eisenhower refused to send federal troops. And the student, Authorine Lucy, decided that she couldn't put her life in the danger that she was putting it. And she decided to withdraw, even though Motley won in the courtroom, saying that she should be admitted. But she couldn't do it. It was just too dangerous. First time Eisenhower sends in federal troops, the, uh, he sends these troops in, federalizes the National Guard, prevents them from stopping the students, and um, they clash. But a thousand federal troops did it, and those nine students were admitted uh, with the help of the, of the uh, federal troops. It's the first time ever that federal troops were used to enforce a Supreme Court decision. Historic, absolutely historic. 1959, University of Georgia and the admission of Charlene Hunter and Hamilton Holmes. You may know Charlene Hunter because she, be, she came, became known to us in PBS as Charlene Hunter Galt. She was the one who did the news hour. She was the one who was the famous CNN and New York Times correspondent. 
in later years. But she was the one who stepped up along with, with Holmes to, to be admitted. So the fight was on. And this was Motley's small local. She always had local lawyers with her when they began these cases. And after two years of litigation, the federal judge orders admission. But rioting immediately broke out. And let me just say that one reason why there were so many delays is she had to go through the lower courts first. All the lower courts were elected positions. The federal judges were appointees. And they did not have the same kinds of political obligations, even though they may have been racist, but they, they, did, they followed the law is what they did. So rioting immediately breaks out. Charlene Hunter is attacked in her dorm, and then she's suspended for safety reasons, that the university couldn't be very safe. And there she is in the, in the little uh, uh, police car being taken away. But 400 faculty rally to reinstate Hunter and Holmes, and the judge orders reinstatement. There she is on the day she entered the university, January 9th, 1961 with Hamilton Holmes, and it's really important because she went on to do great things in her career, which she probably would not have been able to do had she not gotten into this school. She came and visited Judge Motley, and all of the students who Motley handled came to visit her either in Manhattan or in Chester. We had a stream of very illustrious people come to Chester that we didn't even know about. Um, when she did a school like the University of Georgia, she also did the public schools. So this is just one example of one university with the satellite schools that she also managed to get court cases approved and students integrated into these schools. The final two major school desegregation cases are probably her most famous, and that was the University of Mississippi and the University of Alabama second try. James Meredith at the University of Mississippi in 1962. Um, the desegregation of Ole Miss was Motley's most difficult school case because there was so much opposition. She led what was described as the last battle of the Civil War. Um, and she had a much bigger staff when she got to this case. You can see her in this picture. She's seated in the middle there. Um, and she also had the help of the local NAACP, on the left here, if I can point this, I can always, I can move this. This is Edgar, sorry, Medgar Evers. And beside her is Jack Greenberg, who was then the head of the, N, of the LDF, the Legal Defense Fund. But they held press conferences, and Medgar Evers was right by her side. It was Mississippi. He had come from Jackson. Um, and this is right before admission time. The white crowd gathers to protest admission of Meredith. Again, look at that big building and all those pe white people. Federal marshals escort uh, Meredith. Kennedy federalizes the Mississippi National Guard to quell the white protest. But night rioting ends in two deaths. 40 guardsmen and 166 marshals were injured. Governor Barnett files challenge suit again. Do you remember in the movie The Help, they talk about the White Citizens Council where Governor Barnett was the leader of the, of the segregation movement? Well, here he is again in court trying to get this thrown out. But Motley prevails. But she gets picketed. She was always picketed. Kennedy's federal troops prevail over Governor Barnett, and only it's the second time that troops were used. Um, and again, they were picketed in the circuit court in New Orleans. And at the circuit court house, this is where she actually won. And Meredith is admitted to the, to the, to the school. It's a great picture of victory for Meredith in 62. She did 21 trips to Mississippi Federal District Court, more trips to the Fifth Circuit of Court of Appeals in New Orleans, one trip to the Supreme Court to enforce the victory she obtained. And Jack Greenberg described her, when she'd go after some of those Southern defendants, it was like Grant at Vicksburg. She would dig in, appealing in case after case until she defeated them. And that was another one of her great assets. She never gave up, and yet, she gives credit to James Meredith when she said, had it not been for James Meredith, 
who was willing to risk his life, the University of Mississippi, would still be all white. Last big case, and I love this one, I love the pictures from this. Governor of Alabama, George Wallace, you know, segregation now, segregation tomorrow, segregation forever. He stands in the doorway of the school to prevent the admission of the young people that Motley had won admission for uh, in 1963. This is Attorney Katzenbach, the US Attorney General, trying to reason with him. And then the National Guard says, you gotta move Mrs. Motley, just one in court. This is a great picture. Federal troops were, had to be used for the third time. And it is what succeeds. Vivian Malone enters the registrar's office along with uh, James Hood. They register and they're enrolled. Now mostly everyone who got enrolled in this manner had to have guards or people protecting them because their lives were still at risk. It was not over. Violence was always there and always a threat to Motley. She's standing in uh, one of the attorneys, local attorneys, bombed out home, where, by the way, she had to stay because you couldn't stay in a commercial hotel. It was whites only. So she had to stay in these places. This guy's house was bombed 15 times. They called it Bombingham, not Birmingham. And this is what it looked like when she would go from courtroom to courtroom Overnight, over, overnight in every house, there would be, uh, at night she wrote in her book, we were guarded by black men with shotguns and machine guns, and during the day we were escorted to and from court by men who carried handguns. This is an extraordinary thing. And here she was on Cedar Lake Road all these years, and we didn't know about this. At least many of us didn't know about it. And more, than that, we didn't know about her civil rights work that was non-school. The most famous civil rights cases that ever happened in this country, beginning with the Montgomery bus boycott, the lunch counter sit-ins, the Freedom Riders, Birmingham, and I'm just gonna show you these pictures because they're really great and I'll tell you what role she had. 1955 Montgomery bus boycott. Rosa Parks gets arrested because she wouldn't go to the back of the bus for a white man. Walking, not riding, was what they did for over 13 months. They never got on the bus, and they economically injured the bus companies and the town merchants. Rosa Parks and Martin Luther King, through the Montgomery uh, Improvement Association, conducted the first mass, nonviolent, non-cooperation campaign in this country, in Montgomery, Alabama, and Motley was in the heart of it. The 1921 anti-boycott law that the Montgomery Merchants Association used to um, harass and arrest and prosecute the demonstrators or the boycotters, Motley took to court and she challenged it on constitutional grounds and after 13 months of litigation, the case that she and the LDF brought before the US Supreme Court where the law segregating people by race in Montgomery on public transportation was ruled unconstitutional. She did that. It was amazing. 1955 was a really bad year. It was the year that the first University of Alabama case failed and it was the year of the Montgomery bus boycott and that set off white rage like they had never seen. It was the beginning. That's what Brown versus Board of Education actually did. This is Emmett Till who was assassinated for the accusation of uh, touching a white woman who died last year and on her deathbed said she had made it up. Yeah. Lunch counter sit-ins. Uh, the Woolworth counter in Greensboro, North Carolina spread across the South for the next five years. Motley was there. She took on 28 lunch counter sit-in cases, including major ones in Birmingham, Memphis, and Baltimore. She was personally responsible for getting a lot of these uh, protesters out of jail and um, contested the laws that they shouldn't be able to go there uh, <laughs> to sit in in order to stand up. 
She and attorney Greenberg, five years later in 1965, got the Supreme Court to vacate all convictions and expunge records of the thousands arrested in these sit-in protests under the 1964 Civil Rights Act. And there she is on the steps of the courthouse having achieved this amazing victory. They split up the cases and they both won. 1961, the Freedom Rides. People remember the Freedom Rides where they were crossing interstate lines to integrate the buses, which had been a Supreme Court decision in 1960 that you were allowed to ride on integrated buses. But they had to test it because it wasn't working, and they also had to challenge the segregated whites-only bus stations, waiting rooms, restaurants, and rest stops connected to public transportation. This is the map that they, uh, the map that you see here are all the routes. There were hundreds of bus of freedom riders, and everywhere they went, they had this to contend with, as well as in the stations, followed by the Nazis. This is a picture of, of the, the white Nazis who opposed what they were doing. Again, Kennedy calls out the National Guard due to public uh, opposition to what was going on with the Freedom Riders, and they protected the Freedom Riders, but they couldn't protect them in the private whites-only waiting stations. That is where Motley comes in, uh, but first they arrested, in Mississippi it was the worst, they arrested 300 riders, they all went to Parchman Prison, a terrible, horrible prison farm where they were abused. Motley stepped in for their release, and she really worked hard to change the laws having to do with segregated waiting rooms. And she got it finally struck down um, in the courts. John Lewis was among the jailed riders and became Motley's longtime friend and Connecticut visitor. She meets Dr. King in 1962 and represents him in Albany, uh, the desegregation campaign. This is an effort to you know, integrate the libraries, the parks, the movie houses, the restaurants, they, they were, black people were not allowed to go to these places and they just decided Brown versus Board of Education might have been about schools, but we want our freedom too. So Dr. King was called in after 500 people were arrested. The city injunction prohibiting marching goes into effect, but hundreds get arrested again and Motley successfully challenges the injunction, which was known as a TRO at that point, against marching, it was very complicated, and she meets Dr. King for the first time in an Albany courtroom where she was arguing for this case to be relieved. And um, she didn't even know he was in the courtroom. She was so engrossed in what she was doing. And he sat there and he listened to her, and after they became, they got to know each other, she became his lawyer along with other LDF lawyers to help him in his campaigns, his desegregation campaigns. So these are the things that she did across the South for Dr. King, um, gained his release of uh, him and his supporters when they were arrested. She went to court at all levels to argue against unjust arrest. She secured LDF representation of King for future battles and she provided really critical legal intercession at key moments in King's campaigns that changed the course of civil rights history. And the most important was the Birmingham desegregation campaign and the Children's Crusade. So Birmingham was probably the epitome of violence in the South. They had the hoses against the, pro the people who were marching for equal access to the libraries, to the parking, uh, to the parks, to the theaters, to the restaurants, it's the same, it was the same everywhere. Jim Crow laws had kept them out. This is Ingraham Park where they were never allowed, but they went there anyway and of course they got the water counties on them. Bull Connors was the public safety officer. He was notoriously known all across the country because he was so violent and he exercised that power not very judiciously. Um, they brought the dogs as well, and these are just pictures that I'm going quickly on, and they fired all the protesters that they had arrested. They fired them from their jobs, the adults. This was unbelievable, and it was a really low moment for King's campaign in Birmingham. 
he was arrested, wrote that famous letter from a Birmingham jail from, this, from his prison cell, we, why we can't wait. And when this happened, the children decided to step in, that they were the ones who would step in for the adults. And of course, that really horrified the uh, parents and everybody else. They thought this was not a good idea, but they did it anyway, and nobody could stop them. They left their schools, they went and took the places of the adults, and they were all arrested and threatened with jail, which they were jailed. And then when they were arrested, they were also expelled from school. This was really low. Not only were the parents without jobs, but now the kids couldn't graduate. Some of them were young middle school, but a lot of them were high school kids. And this was, this was not good. But again, Motley gets the children released from jail and reinstated in school by going to the federal district court. And she changed the dynamics that were happening in Birmingham by getting the judge uh, to, to, to change the uh, outcome of this children's campaign. And in her autobiography, she wrote this was her most professional and important achievement, or the most important professional achievement. This was really significant. But I never knew about this. I didn't know who the judge, or who the lawyer was who was doing this. And so the effects of the Birmingham campaign were the passage by Congress of the 1964 Civil Rights Act. King and historians believe the reinstatement of the children to school was a turning point that saved the discouraged Birmingham campaign and re-energized the civil rights movement. He also believed that the campaign led ultimately to the passage of the 1964 Civil Rights Act, and more immediately to the successful March on Washington in August following. But that same time period, in, this was May in Birmingham, May of 63, Medgar Evers was assassinated in June, June 11th of 1963. This was her friend. His house was where she and her son Joel stayed when they were in Jackson, Mississippi. And Medgar Evers was assassinated in the carport in this house, right, right there. And that really made her reconsider what she was doing. And she decided that she really needed to leave work in the South physically. And if she wasn't convinced, the children who were bombed in the 16th Street Baptist Church in September really convinced her, the, three, the four little girls. August, the March on Washington, people didn't know whether anybody would show up, but it turns out that it was the largest protest in civil rights history. Martin Luther King led it, and on the mall, they gathered almost a quarter of a million people, and Motley and her son Joel was at the march as a guest of, uh, invited guest of Dr. King. This was amazing. Here he is with the I Have a Dream speech. He's giving the speech. And I, have to, I love this quote from, doc, from uh, Judge Motley. Dr. King finally got his turn at the microphone. We non-believers in the effectiveness of trying to win over die-hard segregation sat in awe as he made his I Have a Dream speech. It brought tears to all of our weary eyes. It was the 20th century's finest hour. And here's John Lewis. And right over here is Constance Motley. The result of the March on Washington was the passage of the 64 Civil Rights Act, giving equal access to all public facilities. Johnson signed it. People came. It was an act that Constance Baker Motley immediately took to the Supreme Court to vacate all of the lunch counter sit-in protesters. But one of the things she said is that the Civil Rights Act meant that Congress finally joined the executive and judicial branches in ending segregation and discrimination in America's public life. In short, the struggle for equal protection under the law had been won. And there she is, I, just a different picture of her at the Supreme Court getting all those convictions overturned. Motley's finally role was in the effort of voting rights in Selma, Alabama. She, uh, well, this was John Lewis again at the uh, Edmund Pettus Bridge. People are very knowledgeable about this. I don't need to probably say very much about it. They tried three times to cross the bridge and start their march to Montgomery 
for voting rights. And um, it was not successful. John Lewis almost lost his life. But on the third try, Dr. King was there, and he led this march, and Constance Baker Motley joined the march and walked the first 10 miles because she felt so strongly about it. Although, I have asked Joel, her son, for a picture of her, and he's looking for it. But she is in this march, and she's walking on the Jefferson Davis Route 80 road towards Montgomery. She said it was her first and last march ever. She hated it. She didn't like it. She said, my job is in the courtroom. Anyway, but she was there because she felt so strongly about the importance of everyone voting. They do get to uh, Montgomery. I, I, I won't go into any more detail. And they get the Voting Rights Act passed. Johnson signs it in 65. He wasn't going to do it because he didn't think he could get it through, but he got it through. And it really changed the ability of people to be protected, for the polling tax to be removed, for all of the silly regulations, uh, like how many jelly beans are in this jar, and how many soap bubbles are in a bar of soap. This is what they had to go through in order to register to vote. None of that anymore. They were now protected. And this was her role. She was the first one in 1947 to litigate the earliest challenge to voter suppression in Rice versus Elmore when she successfully argued that black voters in South Carolina should not be excluded from Democratic Party primary voting because it violated the 15th Amendment. Remember, that was the amendment, the right to vote. Voting in primaries was an integral part of the election process. 1950s and 60s, she defended voting rights activists, and she marched in Selma to be there. And I'll tell you about that in a minute. Motley uh, said this about voting. She said, a Negro who does not vote is ungrateful to those who have already died in the fight for freedom. She felt very strongly about this. This is obviously an uh, older picture. She gave the keynote address at the Southern Christian Leadership Conference Convention in Montgomery, Alabama in 1965, along with Dr. King and Coretta Scott King. She gave the keynote address. And my favorite John Lewis quote, in the heart of the American South during the early days of the civil rights movement in the late 50s and 60s, there were only two lawyers that made white segregationists tremble and gave civil rights workers hope, Constance Baker Motley and Thurgood Marshall. What an amazing statement. Why was she so under-recognized? And this is really important because we haven't got a complete civil rights history without Motley in it. She was humble, and she never tooted her own horn, not even in her autobiography. This is her autobiography. You learn more about the 14th Amendment, due process, and equal access in this book than you do about her great achievements in the civil rights movement. Her great achievements was using the law, equal justice under the law, which is the name of this book. By the way, I have them. They're, um, they're available up here. She was a woman in a man's world, whether the civil rights movement or the legal defense fund. The civil rights movement was a movement led by male pastors and Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, although, at heart, nothing would have happened in the civil rights movement without the tremendous work and organizing abilities of the women. And that was really important. But what Motley was doing, and by the way, um, this is the history of the Legal Defense Fund. There is a beautiful cover. Motley isn't even on the cover, although she's in the book. She's not pictured in the cover. It's amazing. It was a male organization also. Um, she worked behind the scenes quietly in the courts while King was highly visible in the streets, where drama was the stuff of news. Finally, her 66 appointment, 1966 appointment to the federal court closed off all future interviews on her civil rights history. And I found this out by talking to Dr. Ping and maybe from Frank, a couple of other people. She never wanted to talk about her civil rights history or any views on race matters because she was accused, she might be accused of being prejudiced about it. She um, is not even in this definitive history of the civil rights movement. She's not even in the index. 
because she wouldn't give an interview to um, this uh, to um, Taylor Branch, who's the author of this, Parting of the Waters. It was, I, I tried to do the exhibit in the Chester Historical Society. I said, oh, I'm going to find out now what the chronology is of her life. No, she's not even in here. It was, it was quite amazing to find this out. Anyway, her second career, and we come to what was very odd, she went back from the South. She took a part-time job, won an election as the first female African-American state senator in New York State between, um, well not between, but in 1964, she would have time to still do her LDF courtroom work, go to the Supreme Court, argue papers, but she would not go back to the South. She had this job as a state senator, um, and I know we have somebody in the audience today who was a state senator at the same time she was, she was from the 21st Manhattan District. It ran from 96th Street West Side all the way up to Harlem, 161st Street. And she was only there maybe nine months when she was recruited to run for the president of the Manhattan Borough Council of, of New York City. She won that election and um, she was sworn in by Mayor Wagner. You can see her with the families. She was very active in the rejuvenation of Harlem. That was one of the things that she did, but she was also there only a year. Before Johnson, President Johnson recruited her or appointed her a federal judge in the Southern District of New York, which is the famous SDNY that we're hearing about today with the Mueller and the Cohen trials. That's, that is the courtroom that she was uh, appointed for this is her in the Oval Office with Johnson. Um, it's a very famous picture, beautiful picture, but her appointment was objected to by Senator Eastland for the next eight months. It was a very dirty, dirty situation, and maybe that's why she didn't like to talk about it very much. He accused her of bias, of course. Now, this, I love this picture. She's appointed, she gets, she gets the nod, and here she is. Not only the only female, but the only black person in all of these judges in 1966. By 1982, and this is her when she was 45 years old, this is what she looked like in 66. By 1982, she becomes chief judge. And again, I love this picture. Here she is as chief judge. There might be one. See any other women? One. What? Yes. Well, and to see her as chief judge is pretty amazing. She ruled on 2,500 federal rulings, and she covered the rights of women, prisoners, labor, anti-war protesters, drug laws, gambling, Wall Street insider trading, and truth in advertising. But her most famous ruling and the one that everybody knows her for. Not her civil rights work, but they know her as the baseball judge because she took on Bowie Kuhn who had, who had said no women reporters in locker rooms of the baseball players, of the Yankees. And um, <laughs> that was a 1978 decision allowing women reporters into sports locker rooms for which she earned the name the baseball judge. Well. Anyway, this was her official portrait. It's on the, the storyboard. It's out at the uh, preserve. And it was a Thurgood Marshall who came to see her in her chambers in the 1980s. She has a long list of firsts. I've told you many of them. I'm not going to belabor this. But uh, it was really important that she did all the things she did, not only as a woman, but as an African American. And I, I, I won't spend too much more time on it. Finally, we get to Chester. She lived in Chester from 1965 to 2005 as a, a secondary home. She traveled from New York City to be there. And remember, when she bought this house, she was probably a very tired person from all the work she had done in the South. And um, this was something that she really, really loved because she loved being in Connecticut. She loved the outdoors. She loved rural areas. And Chester was very rural in 1965. And she came here for a very good reason. Recognize this fellow? Clarence Blakesley. 
Well, it turns out that Clarence Blakeslee was the silent financial partner of Senator Hazen, who founded the YMCA in Chester in 1920, and it became one of the first integrated YMCA camps in America. And Motley knew this. Blakeslee died in 1955, but she knew about um, Clarence uh, Blakeslee having been the funder of this camp. Well, you know, Cedar Lake Road runs right along the side of, of, of um, the lake. What is the lake? Cedar Lake, yeah. <laughs> it's a little tiring. Anyway, it's, and, and she bought the house the first day she saw it. It was, you know, it needed a lot of work. It still needs a lot of work, right? <laughs> and she loved it. It was a 1745 house, and she fell in love with it, but I think she came to Chester because of this man. She could have had any old house in Connecticut. They had enough money to buy anything, but she loved Chester, and she loved that house. And she remembered the Y, her experience at the Y, in Harlem dramatically broadened her view of the world. So, and, and this is the house. This is the Coleman's house now, right here. This is a house that she wrote a very famous research paper on for the Chester Historical Society. Famous in the sense that it had something like 36 pages of which 15 were footnotes. So here it is, and she gave the paper in 1976 to the Chester Historical Society. It really is a model for historical research. It's a wonderful paper about this house. All right. They just used it as a, as a relaxation place for family, for all her legal defense fund students and workers. Um, this was the secretary to Thurgood Marshall in the center between the Motleys and her sister Eunice. Again, the, Blake, uh, the Baker sisters in 1968. They love just relaxing, ha having picnic, cleaning up the house, just like normal folk. And here's her son, Joel, who's now in his 60s, relaxing. And of course, right behind the house is the Patacong Brook, and Joel Sr. loved to fish. And there's a wonderful blow up of him and the fish over there on the kiosk. And he just really loved that place as much as she did. And they had neighbors and they had relatives come and clear the land when trees fell or they needed help. And this particular picture happens to be on the preserve. You know, it was part of the preserve. So we, we like this picture and we, I think uh, Priscilla blew this up too. They celebrated their 50th wedding anniversary in Chester uh, in 1996. And there they are. There he is, I call him the man behind the woman who made so much possible for civil rights, human rights, and women's rights in America. He is a real hero. And this was, this picture was the Hartford Current picture that was taken when her 1998 autobiography was published. And it was on the cover, it was on the, in the Hartford Current and they gave it to us and said, please have it with our blessings. Tell the world about Constance Baker Motley. And so we love this picture, and that's a blow up too. Um, the autobiography of uh, 1998, that's her biography for which that picture was taken. And um, it's a pretty good book. Her achievements are too many to, to, to even um, repeat, but in general, the, the most famous were that she was inducted into the National Women's Hall of Fame. Connecticut Women's Hall of Fame. She received the Presidential Citizens Medal by President Clinton in 2001. And she has 33 honorary doctorate degrees from the most outstanding universities in the country. Um, this was an amazing person who lived among us and we, we didn't really know. So um, there was the film made of her in 2012. This film, I also have copies of this if anybody's interested. I love this. And in fact, I suggested that this film be shown tonight and not me talking. It's, and I was overridden. And partly it's because it's a, it's a film that doesn't go into very much of her civil rights background. But it does talk about her federal judgeship. And it's very interesting. I recommend it. It's very well done.
um, she had a first biography. Last year, somebody finally wrote a biography about her, Dr. Gary Ford, and he came and did a book signing here in Chester. This is a wonderful book, and the book is about her achievements that were un underdocumented, unrecorded, and now they're recorded in this book. So I learned quite a bit from this book. The land trust, the wonderful land trust, purchases her land across the street from her house and turns it into a beautiful preserve. If you haven't been out there, please go. It was dedicated in May of 2017. And Yaz and Bill have done so much work to get it ready. And the Coleman's have helped all the time, right across the street, helping pitch in. Whatever is needed, they're there. And we're very lucky to have such wonderful stewards of this woman's, you know, this great woman's property. We did the exhibit at the Chester uh, Museum right at the time the preserve was dedicated. And then this past fall, it was put on the Freedom Trail. The preserve and the house both put on the Freedom Trail. And that was a great, great honor. This, in fact, she was already on the front cover of their brochure from the New Haven House. It's really interesting. They're, do, they're redoing the brochure. And the Rotary, thank you, Rotary. They give a scholarship to a child from New Haven every summer to attend Camp Hazen in honor of Constance Baker Motley. Lack of encouragement um, never deterred me. I was the kind of person who would not be put down. So this is a beautiful, I love this picture. But I love this quote more. This is the final slide. Becoming a part of history is a special experience. Nobody can take it away from you. You may be forgotten, but it's like immortality. You will always be there. And that's it. <laughs>